Which brings me to two funny stories about Idaho. Um, sorry if this one's inappropriate. Just starting it off the bat. Uh, so far, the other groups have thought it was funny, and there's been a couple frowns that I told the story, but I think it's safe. It's funny. Um, Basically, so when we're down there, we stay at Pastor Gerald and my mom's house. They, they have this like house that's right on the creek. It's a small little house and it's just nice and it's peaceful. And, but basically it's been kind of like our sanctuary when we get done just getting beat up all day long there. And we, we, we retreat back to this house in Hagerman. It's like 35, 40 miles away. And we just kind of hang out there. But it's starting to get hot, right? It's starting, when I say hot, like I mean, we're way hotter here, but down there 85 and 90 degrees, with, with a little bit of humidity feels hot, like it's sticky and kind of gross. So uh, we get there. We're out in the middle of nowhere, mind you. And so, um, you know, I just do what I, why not? You know, I just go to boxers right when I walk in. All right, that, that's the awkward part. I go straight to boxers, right? I walk in the house. It's nice and cool. Audrey's, <laughs> Audrey has all her work clothes on. My daughter's clothes, but I'm in my boxers. That's how it's going to work. So we're there and I'm sitting on the couch and basically I'm sitting in this chair here. She's sitting here. My daughter's playing in the middle. And uh, apparently my mom thinks it's okay because I have no cell phone service down there to call and say, yeah, come over and visit any time. You know, these people that are going to start moving, they're moving down to Yucca Valley. Their kid's going to school here. I've never met him in my life. And my mom says, yeah, just go by our house. Here's the address, right? So they're just down the street a little ways. And I'm sitting on this couch, a chair, and I'm sitting there and no one's ever came up through the back. Like no one has ever walked around. And see, keep in mind, there's, they have a beautiful view. So this whole side is glass doors. And uh, I'm sitting there watching TV and Audrey goes, oh my gosh, someone's here. And I look and there's someone at the door. So I do this roll spin move onto the ground and I'm sitting behind the couch and I realize the couch isn't very big and I'm kind of big. So I'm sitting there like cr crumpled behind this couch and I'm, I'm like, Laura, come here, Laura. And so I grab Laura and I'm like, hi, oh, you're playing with daddy. And she goes, I want to go say hi to the people. So she pushes me away, runs to the door with Audrey, and Audrey and I have no clue who this is, and they're like, hello, we're Jehovah's Witnesses, joking around, right? And so we're like, oh, and then Audrey's like, oh, and they're like, no, we're actually, we're moving here, and yeah, uh, you know, Marilee told us to come by and to meet, you know, BJ and to meet you, and, 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 and I'm just sitting there with no shirt on with a blanket wrapped around me going, how am I going to get out of this, right? So I'm like, I'm like, Laura, go get daddy some clothes. And she's like, no. And so she runs off and I'm just like sitting there like, okay, this is awkward. This is really weird. They have this boy who's going into being a, a junior in high school and he's just kind of like, and, and I'm basically trying to hide behind the couch, much like a camel trying to hide behind a blade of grass. And I'm just like, you know, like, but I don't want to like stand up and be like, hey, how you doing? You know, so I'm just, I'm just, I'm just sitting there with this blanket and it's like 90 degrees. So it's really hot. I shouldn't have a blanket on. And, and, and Audrey, she's not playing interference at all for me. She's, I'm sitting here and she's just like, yeah, so what's going on? Yeah, no, okay, absolutely. Like just try not to laugh because she knows I'm over here sitting in my underwear. And, and finally I just go, could you get me some clothes? Like five, 10 minutes into it. Most of the time where people would be like, hey, uh, wh wh I'm going to just sit over here and I'm going to go get this. You know, she just let him talk for 10 minutes and let me sit down in the living room, look like a total weirdo. And, and so I get up and I get out, I get out talking to him and they are dying laughing. They're like, well, you really get to know your pastor at Joshua Springs, don't you? <laughs> And I was just, oh man. And the kid's like, the kid, the, uh, I'm really excited because I get to spend some time with him at the summer camp. But he was just like, wow. Like, I thought it was kind of weird that you're sitting there with a blanket on in 90 degree weather in the middle of the room. And she's like, I just thought you were being rude. She's like, they all talked about how outgoing you were. And she's like, when you didn't come up to the door, I was like, well, what's the problem? And she's like, and then I saw you didn't have a shirt on. I was like, uh-oh. So... <laughs> There's that story. And second story I have for you is, as you guys heard, Gerald left me a bunch of ducks. Uh, not, not only is he like, okay, here, I'm going to send you to Idaho, and you're going to be like a person in a foreign land over here in Idaho and, 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 and have all the drama and fun of every day there. I know you're going to raise some ducks. So I'm like, 
Fantastic. So I'm raising these ducks, and, and it, was, it was really actually kind of cool. Like, I, we, we told Laura that they're her ducks, you know, and, and that she has to take care of them, you know, and, or, or, you know, that you're their mommy, you know. And so she'd go out to them every night and sing them, Jesus loves me. To, I need to sing to them or they won't go to sleep, you know. And I was like, oh, you are so adorable. Um, then she also would like, you know, she was just wake me up every morning at like six in the morning, seven in the morning saying, Dad, the ducks are hungry. You need to go feed the ducks. So I'm like, oh, so I'd go feed the ducks. But it was just a wonderful time until Gerald's like, you know, you should let them out more. And I'm like, what do you mean? They have a pen and he, they should go out and play in the water. And then I should go and gather them back up and put them back in the pen. And uh, they're getting pretty big at this point. And I'm like, are you sure? He's like, they're easy to catch. They're easy, he says. <laughs> so, so, you know, I should have known by how hard it was to even get them in the, like, the big box to go put them out in, into the water. So, uh, but anyways, three or four hours go by, and it's time to get them back into their pen. And Audrey is terrified of these ducks. Like, she thinks they're like geese or something, and they're going to like bite her arms off or something. So she's like, no. And she's like, she's like running from them, and I'm running at them, and we're just trying to chase these ducks. And, you know, I'm starting to get kind of worked up. Because it's like, not, I'm not mad. I'm just like angry that the ducks are so quick. And so I'm like chasing it. I'm like a big, big guy out there trying to catch these ducks. And I'd get one and I got him. And you know, I'd put him back. And Laura, she's, they, they make noise when you pick them. Like, ah, 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 ah. And Laura goes, you're hurting them. And I'm like, I'm not hurting them. I'm not hurting them. And she just, she, she, she's, she's a little sinner. She switches, right? <laughs> she switches and she turns into like, she's, she puts up her pinchers. She has these two little pinchers that she does. And she goes, stop hurting my ducks. And she starts pinching me. And so I'm like bending over and picking up these ducks and, and pinching them. And she's pinching me. I'm like, ah, so I end up getting them all in there. And I'm just like exhausted, covered in bird. And like, so I, I decide I'm going to call Gerald and, and just let him know exactly how blessed I was by those ducks. <laughs> so I call Gerald and I just go, Hey, um, <clears throat> you know, I, you're a liar. <laughs> and he goes, excuse me? Because I've never talked like that to Gerald, like ever, <laughs> believe me. I was like, you didn't tell me the truth. And so he's, his mind's going like something about the river, something about the church, something that he said to me that didn't come true or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, you just didn't tell me the truth. And he's like, well, what's going on? And I said, those ducks are not as easy to catch as you said they were. And it's quiet because he's doing this. <laughs> you know that laugh he does where it's so funny that it stops and then, it, then just a, a sound comes out. It's like, ah! <laughs> That's what happened. So blessed to be back, blessed to be with you. I couldn't have asked to be with a better group of people. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, turn them to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. See, I, uh, when I went up there, the minute I got there, they started to talk to me. And uh, keep in mind, it was basically about a week's time and then I was officially in Idaho. Like, it was like you woke up one day and now you're in Idaho. And um, so when I got there, I didn't really have a vision or a plan except to teach them, uh, you know, through the word and to just be there for them. But I didn't really have like a set plan for them. And they wanted to know right when I got there the first day. So what's the plan? What are the marching orders? What are we doing? What, what, what scriptures are you using for us to be moving forward as a church? And I was like, you know, honestly, I just woke up. I, I don't know what's happening. I woke up one day and now I'm here. And so please bear with me. And I, so I started like, okay, Lord, what are we? what are we doing? Okay, yes, I, I, I just always teach, you know, and so I started going through the book, and then I got to Ephesians, and I'm like, this is awesome, and then I got to Ephesians 4, and I'm like, this is what should happen, right? Ephesians 4 is one of those things that was written to, to the church of Ephesus, but man, every generation, every church around the world, every group of people that are believers can can gleam off of what Ephesians 4 says. We're only gonna do the first half of it and then we'll do the next half of it next time I teach, which will probably be in about a month. And so I just wanna encourage you guys, it's coming, the next half of it is coming. But this first half, I, I love Ephesians because the first three, it's, it's, there's a lot of deep stuff. There's a lot of, a lot of basis of our belief, a lot of different stuff like that. But the last, the last chapters are all about um, application and how we apply it to our lives. 
And I, and I love the application part of, of the word because I like to look at my own life and go, okay, so how can I change things? Holy Spirit, what do you want to do in my life? I love doing that. And there's tons of that. So before we even get started, let's actually, let's go ahead and start with chapter four, verse one. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling in which you were called, with all lowliness, gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of, his, uh, to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean? But that he was first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ to we uh, um, all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting but speaking truth uh, speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part, every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that we live in a country where we can still do this. Lord, we pray right now, Lord, that you would just come here right now, Lord God, your Holy Spirit would fall upon this building and you would begin to move in this room like you've never moved before. Lord, we all come here with an expectation, Lord, that you are going to move. Lord, and it, for the people here that are here or drug here or had to come here, Lord, I just pray that you would begin to break their heart right now and get them in the right spot. Lord, do something that only you can do, Lord. These words are words without your Holy Spirit making a mean something. So Lord, right now, show up here, start to work on hearts. Lord, do whatever you got to do in this place. And Lord, we just, Lord, anything that anybody has brought in here, Lord, anything that wants to hinder this message from going out, Lord, we just pray it leaves in Jesus' name, Lord. It's spirit speaking to spirit and we can be one body just under your banner of Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you and thank you for, for making a way and giving us grace, Lord. It's by your grace we're saved. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so Ephesians chapter one. So, so I talked about, um, well, let me just go ahead and go chapter four, verse one. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling in which you were called. You know, it's so funny. My whole life I've always heard, when you see a therefore, you gotta go find out what it's there for. I mean, my whole life, every pastor I've ever heard, I don't know if it's like in a pastor's hilarity book somewhere, but I've heard it from every pastor ever. And the truth is, that's what it means. We need to go figure out what it was. So if we start breaking down the chapters, in Ephesians one, we find out that, we are adopted by, we are adopted by uh, God. That it's, it's even with all your screw-ups, even with all your mistakes, even with all your problems, he chose you while you were at enmity with God. Even the faith that you had which you came to God was supplied from God so you could come to him. Do you guys realize how little of anything you had to do with that? He was pursuing you the whole time. He has adopted you. The next thing we find out in chapter two, that we are one body, the Jew and Gentile, that we are all under one. We are all under the banner of Jesus Christ. He has come to level the playing field. He has come to make us equal. There's none here greater than another. There's no priest, no anything that is holier than someone else because we are not of our own righteousness. We all point to Jesus Christ through us. We look at the next one, and, and this is where we left off. Uh, this, is where, this is where it leaves off. This is the, the big therefore. In chapter three, verse 17, it says, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and height 
to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask and think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever, amen. Man, the last one, that you guys have this love, this love that is in Christ that you can't even describe. You know, how wide, long, and deep, and high is, is God's love for us, right? I mean, where did God find you? How far did he reach into your life when you were at your lowest, right? He brings us up to our highest. He, his, his love stretches across the world. His, his, his love for us, Christ's love for us is unfathomable. We have no picture of it. We get slight little glimpses of how we have our own children and things like that, but that shares nothing to how much he loves you. So what he's saying here in chapter four, verse one, I therefore, therefore all those things we just talked about, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling in which you were called. So how are you reacting to those things that we had just told you? That, that all the word has just told you, Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, how are you reacting to the love that you have experienced? How are you reacting to, to being adopted by, by Christ? How, how are you reacting to that? So what is this telling us? It's telling us that we should be walking in a certain way. Contrary to popular beliefs, Christians should be, you know, looking a certain way, acting a certain way. I think it's crazy that today we kind of have this world is like, what well, if you're saved, that's no big deal. You know, great, you're saved. You live your life how you want. I don't see that here. I see Paul starting off chapter four, verse one, saying, I urge you, I urge you to, 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 to walk worthy of your calling. How is your life reflecting that calling? How is your life reflecting it? The, the, the fact that we don't have to work to have God love us, but because he loves us so much and because we are part of his family, that it moves our hearts to work. Not because we have to, but because our lives are dramatically changed and the things that are in our lives that are dramatically changed, it changes history for us. For the rest of our lives, we are being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ every day. And your life now should look nothing like it will be in 10 years. Your life now should look nothing like it was in 10 years. Your life has completely changed if you've had a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you walking worthy of your calling today? He begins to show us what it kind of looks like to walk worthy of your calling. He says, walk worthy of your calling with all lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I love that. Why do we walk this way? Why should we walk this way? How dare Paul urge us to walk this way? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus for showed you every one of those things in your own life before he even asks you to do it to someone else. If, if it was a totally different way, you do as your daddy does. You do as Jesus did for you. We see that it says right here, the, I mean, the way Jesus lived, was Jesus lowly? Was he gentle? Was he long-suffering? Did he bear with one another? Absolutely. He bared with the people that wanted to kill him. He loved the people that wanted to kill him. So let's look at these words. The first word is lowly, lowliness. It's the idea of oneself being humbled. It's the humility and modesty. How many problems can be avoided today if you just held your brothers and sisters higher than yourself? Listen, every division I've ever been in in a church or any problem I've ever seen in a church, it's always been deep-rooted with sin and it's always had a problem of self and holding themselves higher than the situation that's happening. I don't like the way they're doing this. I don't like, the, do you notice that the common denominator is I? It's, a, it's not God, it's, it's I don't like the way they're doing this. I don't like the way he said that to me. That hurt my feelings. It, you have to hold your brothers and sisters higher than yourself or you are going to get offended extremely quick at many people in here. Gentleness, I love that, that, that Jesus and, has just been so gentle with me. Man, another word for this gentleness is meekness. Is, is there, is, do you have a justification in your heart to go after somebody else? Do you have a right to get mad? Maybe so. But that word gentleness or that word meekness is talking about even having all the ammo in the world to go after him and choosing not to for the sake of unity. 
That is what our heart should be because that is where our God was with, our God is with us. Long suffering. What does long suffering mean in the Greek? It means suffering long, right? It's basically what it means. It never is fun any way you talk about it, but it's probably the least amount of fun out of all these but having patient endurance, you know, willing to get out of your comfort zone, willing to have your comfort taken away once again for the sake of the unity. Think about all those things, all those things that we, na- we just named, and think about how they've been shown to you first. The only way that you can begin to, 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 uh, to, to go against those things is being prideful and thinking that anything good is within you. Anything good about you is from Jesus Christ. Anything good. That, I mean, everything you are, I mean, the only, the only thing worth redeeming is from Jesus Christ. And if you recognize that it's all in him, your lives, your, your whole heart, your, the way you treat each other is gonna dramatically change. Listen, I promise you, if you have not had this happen yet, there's going to be someone, I'll promise you, this is a promise, that there's gonna be someone in here, if you get to talk to them long enough, that are going to annoy you and cause you problems. I promise, we're a, we're a group of believers that are in the work of, God has been working on some of us for a long time and there's things that he's still pulling out of us. So I promise you, maybe I'm that person for you today. Maybe I'm the one sitting up here and you're like, oh my gosh, him again, right? But the truth of it is, is we, to, <laughs> I kind of went off a trail on that one. But anyways, I, I mean, but there's a time coming when you're going to, to get annoyed with someone. But the truth is, do you love them? Do you remember their work in progress? Do you remember the grace and the long suffering and the gentleness and the lowliness and and the meekness that you were shown? Do you remember those things? Because if we are, there's no room for us to have our pride puff up, right? And why do we do that stuff? In 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 verse three, it says, uh, chapter four, verse three, it says, we do it to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. I love that we don't provide the unity. Oh man, praise the Lord that we are not the reason that there's unity. It's the Holy Spirit that provides that unity. However, it is up to us to keep the unity that the Holy Spirit has provided, right? So what does that mean? To give, dilig- to give diligence to or to hasten. So since God is providing the unity, what causes the discord? It's our flesh, it's our sin, it's, it's, it's demonic attack that causes that. We need to recognize it for what it is when your flesh starts to rise up and put it to death and say, I'm not that person anymore, okay? When we look at this too, this providing the unity, you know, we cannot in our own life control every situation. There may be someone that is right next to you right now or across the room from you right now that doesn't like you for who knows what reason. Listen, it boggles my mind sometimes what people get mad about. I'm with you guys, all right? But the truth of it is everything that is within you, right? Everything that has to do with you holding the unity, that's what you need to focus on. I can't control what someone's gonna say about me, but I sure can control what I say about someone else through the Holy Spirit, it has been Satan's goal to divide the church for years. To, to get you guys worked up over simple things, to, to tweak your flesh just enough to where that person offended you, this person offended you, and you leave and, and, and take people with you. Make sure you rip the family apart. You know, even in your own life, do you have family that you can't talk to or members of your own life that, that is co- like causing so much pain in your family because of one member, Right? Think about that as our own body. When we cause problems with one another, it hurts the whole body. It hurts the whole family when, when two people are fighting. I had a youth group in Calvary Chapel, Buell, and it was at strong 30 people. God was moving. God was doing awesome things. Not necessarily through my teaching because I was doing my best, but I wasn't doing very well. And, uh, but basically, God was doing awesome things, and two girls got in a fight over one guy. The two girls got in such a big fight that they began to spread their gossip at school. And then the next week, neither one wanted to come and see the other one. So they, each group had taken sides and I was left with three people that had nothing to do with the fight. Those people may have never set foot back in a church again and Satan might have victory at that. Think about the times that this has happened. Think about the churches that have split and the people saying, well, if the church, if we can't get along as believers and I'm never going back there. The people that are taking notice of how we treat other churches, how our life as believers, how we treat ourselves, are we attracting people to Jesus by the love we have for one another? God wants us to endeavor to keep it. Listen, I'll tell you the most depressing thing in my life when I was up in, up in uh, Idaho 
It was the fact that every Christian church seemed like they were at fight with one another. This church didn't like this church. This church didn't like this church. This church was glad this church broke up so that they could have some of the people from it. And this church just wishes they had more people. And this church is always playing the numbers game. And this church is, it's just crazy. All of them are fighting each other. They're all in discord. They're all messed up. There's a principality over Twin Falls, Idaho that is tearing apart believers. And they're not even recognizing what's happened. I didn't recognize what happened. And it was happening when I was growing up. But when you step back and you see how God's working in somewhere else and then you walk back into it, you're like, whoa. But yet the Mormons, man, they, they have it together. They have churches that they go to. They have a temple. They do all these things together. Different churches go to different churches and they hang out and they have all these, these different you know, family nights and this and that. Listen, the enemy and I'm not saying that they're the enemy, but the enemy has bound them together, that they are strong. And you know what? People are attracted to that. Wow, they get along so well and their family is doing so well. And, you know, the Book of Mormon, yeah, sure, it's, it's probably, you know, not the word of God, but you know what? There's something to be said about the way they treat each other. That should not be them. That should be us. Jesus Christ through us should be that person. And I'm not yelling at you and I'm not talking down to you. I'm including myself. I'm not 100%, you know, out of this, this thing either. When I preach, I preach with conviction because I know I need to change some things. We need to be together as a body, forgiving one another, loving one another, being gentle and kind and, and lowly and all these different things because there's an enemy who's trying to divide us. I promise you he's at work right now. We see here, Verse four, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through you all and in you all. This is to all believers. He's speaking to believers, not all religions. This is not how it works. It's, it's not saying that we're all one body, every religion is all going to heaven, so kumbaya. You know, it's not saying that. But as believers, we all share those same things. So if we're sharing those things, shouldn't our differences be pale in comparison to the fact that we are all under those one things? We are all under one body, one spirit, uh, you know, one hope of calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Shouldn't our petty differences be put aside? You know, I think it's so funny is we kind of tend to have a way of thinking that the way God works at our church is like totally different than the way God works at every other church and that like our church has it right, right? Isn't that kind of like what we think? And I know no one wants to admit it, but come on, right? You just kind of tend to not even think about other believers or other groups of churches. And I don't think that's right. Listen, one thing I love to, that our, about our pastor, one thing I love is that is not his heart. I told you guys earlier, but listen, there is no reason why Gerald should be reaching out to, to places in Idaho. He has nothing to gain from it. There's no monetary gain. There's no, there's no status gain. He's doing it because he loves people and that that church in Idaho is a body. That church down the street is part of the body. And if when we're all focusing and we're all working together, we are a healthy moving unit. And so when one weird little arm, shoulder, elbow, or something way in Idaho is hurting, Gerald wants to go take care of it. He's a great man to look up to, I'm telling you. I could talk about it like, because he's not here, so I could talk about him. But, but the truth of it is, is I wouldn't be here if Gerald wasn't obedient to God's calling. There was a little church in Buell, Idaho, you know, a couple hundred people, and my dad kept meeting with Gerald over and over and over again at these, these, these uh, conferences that they'd go to, these pastor's conferences, and basically he would talk to Gerald, and well, anyways, Ger my dad started to get sick, and you know, you know found out he had cancer, and, and Gerald said, anything I can do to help your church, let me know. And my dad said, well, okay, I could use someone to come teach it. And he said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm getting too weak to make it to the pulpit. And I, I, I still come to church, but I can't sit up there without being in pain for more than five minutes. And so Gerald, on his own dime, on his own life, began to send people that made his life a little bit more uncomfortable here, but he was sending his pastors to teach my dad's church. I was there for that. And it was awesome to see a new pastor from here coming every single week to take care of my dad to take care of that body of believers. And then when my dad died, he was there to make sure that church got a good pastor. Sent Jackie, sent his best guy, sent the guy that you know, everyone loved, sent him to go take this church because 
That is what Jackie's heart was being pulled to do. And Gerald has no problem with letting those people go. He was even so nice, he married my mom, you know? <laughs> so so that's, 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 a huge, that's a huge win, you know? But the truth of it is, God had a plan. And, God's, and, and through Gerald's obedience to him, God's been doing awesome things here. But listen, we also can't make a mistake to not just think about the churches that are in Idaho, but the churches that are down the street. The little group of believers, the, the same gifts, the, 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 the same God with just diversity of different gifts, I meant to say. I mean, churches all around the world are happening right now and, and they're doing it totally different. And it doesn't make it any worse and it doesn't make it any better. It's just diversity. Some people feel called to having a rock band up here and being able to worship that way. Some people are into hymnals, right? And that's fine. If you want to do it that way, that's fine. That's just different. Some people are more traditional in their uh, approach to church. Some like pastors that, you know, it, it's all in difference. It's all in, in diversity of the spirit. You know, some people are more charismatic. Some people are a little bit more dancey. Some people pray differently. Uh, some people do some stuff I don't completely understand. But if it's not unbiblical, then why should we over here have a problem with what they're doing over there? If they are our believers and they are our brothers and sisters, and even if we think that some of the stuff that they're doing is a little bit weird, even though, I mean, as long as it's, as long as it's okay with the Lord, we should have no problem with it and we should just love them. They should be our brothers and sisters down there. <clears throat> and like I said, that's one reason I'm glad and blessed to be here. And don't get me wrong, I think this is the best church in the world. I'm not joking. This is my, I've been to a lot of churches, but you know why I feel like it's the best church in the world? Because I've been called here. This is where I grow. This is where the Lord has me planted and I'm joyful and happy to be here and under Gerald and under you guys and all of us working together. I love it. So I'm saying that we have the best church to me, but that's the best church to them and that's the best church to them and that's the best church for them in Idaho. And, um, but that's just kind of where my heart is. If you wanna see the diversity of the gifts being used in so many different ways, it's so awesome how we have all these different things opened up where we have concerts and these bands that come through and they have all different approaches to ministry. They're all different walks of life, all different. Some of them are weirdos, some of them aren't. And I mean weirdos in a good way. They have some of them like little hipsters that wear like their grandma's cardigan and they have like hipster glasses. Some of them like, you know, have girl pants or whatever they're wearing. Some of them have long hair, some of them have tattoos, but they're all over the place, different people. And then some of them will be up here leading you worship. And everyone's like, oh man, that band was so anointed. It was such a blessing. But then you don't know where they are afterwards because they go out to their van and they don't really spend time because their ministry is in their music, right? They do, they're, they're just kind of socially awkward people and so they don't necessarily, they're not very good. So, so their ministry is all in their music and when they're on stage, but listen, those bands that stand up here and scream and everyone's like, how could that be glorifying to the Lord? I can't understand a word it says. Well, I'll tell you, those kids are, those guys are hanging out with your children and giving them something to look up to as, as someone who loves the Lord that they feel is edgy and cool. They're pouring into your children so it's, it's a diversity of different gifts. It's not wrong. If it's not biblical, I mean, if it's, not, if it's not unbiblical, then it's not wrong. In fact, this video I'm about ready to show you guys, he, this is Aaron Stone. He, uh, he did our winter retreat uh, about two, two years ago, and he's been a good friend of mine for numerous years, but his band played here. They're, they're a loud band. They're on Face Down Records. I encourage you actually to listen to them because they actually sing. They don't scream, but it's called My Epic. But his heart is, is everything that we just talked about and he sums it up beautifully. So if you wanna go ahead and play that. So our heart should be to carry on the unity. Our heart should be in the realization that we are all under one, right? And that even here in this body, as well as all the other bodies, that they are brothers and sisters of us. So we go on, it says in verse seven, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. So we find out here that we have gifts that were given to us. He gave gifts to men and some he gave and he begins to talk about these different things. And we're gonna look at it. He gave some to be apostles, ones that start and oversee other ministries. One apostle that I think we can see in modern day would even be Chuck Smith, right? Look at, look at the churches that man has started that through the Holy Spirit's gift through him. You know, we, we see the word prophet there. Um, basically prophet, this is a word that gets just thrown through the dirt 
heard on numerous occasions, but one that speaks uh, the word of the Lord in the spirit, not necessarily in a predictive sense, but just it can be, but also too, just speaking the word of the Lord to you or to the church on, on, a, on a level of, you just know it's that. Listen, I, I've had many times where people in my life have spoken something to me that has been directly from the Lord. I mean, it is so crazy. It was exactly what I was going through. No one, knew, no one could have known what was happening and they speak something truth to me, something that, that just rings true. And that is what that gift is. And listen, it's so funny because Usually, if someone comes up to you and says, I'm a prophet, you know, or says, listen, I need to be hired by your church because I'm a prophet, you know, and they begin to speak. I've also had times where people have called themselves prophets and spoken over me, and everything within me cringes, right? There's differences. You're, it, uh, for, for you believers out here, you guys have the Holy Spirit. How do you guys know if someone really is a prophet? Well, when they speak to you, your Holy Spirit will instantly recognize it. Your Holy Spirit will instantly go, this is for you, this is beautiful. And then if it's crazy, you're instantly gonna go, this man's crazy, right? Because it's true. And we see evangelists. We see that that's one of the gifts. Basically, this is people that are gifted in preaching salvation in Jesus Christ. Basically, we have wonderful uh, examples of that with Billy Graham and Greg Glory. Listen, their heart is always reaching out, always doing some big reach out on, on a new scale. And now they're using internet and all these different things. But let me tell you, it's so funny because don't even try to study what they're saying and try to mimic what they're doing because really what they're saying is you're a sinner, you need Jesus, come to the Lord. And the people are like, oh, really? Okay, you know, and they come forward because it's a gifting that God is using through them. It has nothing to do with the message they're doing. It's God through them giving the message, right? So that's what's happening. And pastors and teachers, these are often used together as well. We see that a lot, especially here. And, and, and most churches, there's pastors and teachers being used together. But there are different people that are, are, are more pulled to one or the other. Listen, there's pastors who are very focused on, on um, the, the protecting and the loving of the flock, right? They're having that heart for the people. Whatever, whatever you guys need, let me come alongside. Let me pray for you. Let me go on hospital visits. Let me do this. Having a heart for the people is a pastoral heart, a pastor's heart. And there's also teachers and that their whole life is to be grounded in the word and to have you be grounded in the word and to give you guys deep things to chew on and to think about. And there's people that are teachers. But listen, here's the problem. Problem. Both of those things need to be focused on the Lord and the love that he has for other people before anything. I think what's scary right now is we have people in America that call themselves teachers and they think they can get away with doing the work of God because they just call themselves something else besides a pastor. Oh, I'm not a pastor, I'm a teacher. Oh, so that means you can live however you want and not love people? Because that doesn't sound like the way that works, right? And I may be overstepping my boundaries and saying that a little bit, but it's driving me crazy, right? People that just call themselves teachers so they don't have to deal with people is not the way Jesus was. Our Jesus loved everyone, including teaching. He did both. So those words work so well together. I also want you guys to go ahead and write down in your Bibles. We're not gonna go through them, but 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses one through 12, right next to the, the, the gifts there. There's more gifts right there. 1 Corinthians 12, chapter, uh, chapter 12, verses one through 12. And then there's uh, Romans 12, verses four through nine. And basically those are more gifts that are listed, right? More spiritual gifts that God gives freely. And I think it's very, very important that we come to rec uh, recognize our giftings and use them accordingly and pray to the Lord, Lord, what is your gift for me? What, what should I be doing? What is my role in this body? And, you know, because it's one of those things that so many times we let one mouthpiece do all the work, Right? We all need to be doing it, right? We are all equal in this thing. We're all moving forward. And so we're gonna see what it's for here in verse 12. It says, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge and of the, uh, of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the uh, measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Basically, that perfect means mature and complete. So what do we see with our giftings? What happens? It's for the equipping of the saints, not necessarily just used to evangelize. It's used to strengthen us for the work at hand. 
It's used to, to grow us, to strengthen one another. One, what did I say earlier? That we're slowly being turned into the image of Christ, slowly, 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 trying every day to walk worthy of the calling, to look a different way than we did years ago. And it's, and it's with people, all of us working together, all of us sharpening one another. And it says in verse 14 that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Let's see what it says right there. The you should no longer be children. We have a lot of men and women in here that are children. I mean, seriously, I'm, I'm not coming off and saying, oh, this is how it is, but I'm just telling you the truth. In every church around the world right now, in every body of believers, there's full-grown men and women. If you could see them for their spiritual maturity, they would be in diapers sucking on a bottle. People that have been in the church for 30 years in diapers sucking on a bottle. They've never once tried to seek the Lord on their own. They've never once had a prayer life. They never once focused on the Lord and their, and their children. And listen, there's a time to be a children. There's time to be a kid. My daughter's adorable right now with the stuff she does. But if you were a full grown adult acting like my daughter, we'd ask like, what was the problem, right? It just, it just gets old. It's time for us to grow up. It's time for us to mature. It's time for us to put away being a child anymore. And you know why we need to do that? So we can recognize the cunning craftiness, the deceitful plotting of the enemy as he tries to throw all sorts of winds of doctrine through here. Every few years, there's something that comes through. And listen, people and churches around the world are being deceived. They're being deceived by these things that happen, these winds of doctrine. Satan uses the same thing he's always used for years. Basically what he takes is a couple verses in the Bible and he mixes them around enough and, and he's actually using scripture so that's where a lot of people get off on it. They, they, they kind of go over here because he's using a couple pieces of scripture but you don't read the rest of the chapter. You don't read the rest of the book. You just take two verses and then by the time you're going forward in your ministry, by the time you go over here, a couple of years later, you don't even remember where you were. You're off on a whole different religion. You're on a whole different path, right? And I mean, I've seen so many different things blow through the church since I've been there. Um, you know, basically, I mean, you see holy laughter, man. You see people like having convulsions in the aisles and, you know, all these different things. You know, you hear about, t this is the worst one in my opinion, absolute worst. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a ministry that talks and they're really big. I'm not gonna say their name, but they basically talk about you need to be toking the ghost. It sounds exactly what it sounds like. You walk around acting high because you have the Holy Spirit. You walk around acting drunk because the Holy Spirit. But I, I mean, not, not because you're joyful, but because you're walking around like this and like, oh man, God's awesome. And you, instantly your mind goes to college age kids, right? You're like, yeah, that's a college age. There's grandmas, grandpas, dads, mothers walking around doing this. How did that happen? Well, they got off on the, the, the whole being, you know, drunk in the spirit and these different things. And they're like, oh, we all gotta act drunk all the time. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? These are immature people grabbing a hold of the word and grabbing a hold of one little verse and, and they're, being they're being deceived. And it, sure, it's kind of funny for us, but at the same time, we should be depressed for those people. That they are being so deceived that they think that they're walking in truth and it has nothing to do with truth. The prosperity gospel, a bunch of people telling you that if you're not, if you're not reigning in the money and having all these blessings that somehow you're in sin or you're not doing it right, right? There's the emergent church, this young generation that's coming up and taking different things out of the Bible that they don't wanna focus on and focusing on others to making it say what they want. Let's talk about Chrislam, a mix of Christianity and Islam. There's major Christian pastors accepting that all around the world. They have a congregation of people that aren't saying anything, that are letting them be led astray. They're being children. There's the book of Judas. I remember when that was found. And it's one of those things where it's like, you know, everyone's, well, what do you think about the book of Judas? The rumor has it, it, it looks like it was really written by Judas. And it talks about how he, he betrayed Jesus, but because Jesus asked him to, what do you think about that? Should we, that's something we should look into? Well, Jesus, uh, Judas was a liar and a traitor. Why wouldn't he write like a liar and a traitor, right? We shouldn't follow these winds of doctrine, the, the book of Judas, and they found some other book that should have been there. I believe my God, like I've said a hundred times, allows you to breathe and allows your body from not exploding. He's holding you together. And if my God wants to keep the books in the Bible that are there, he'll keep them there. No other book is gonna come into that Bible for me. Amen? And so we have to look at that. <clears throat>
But my biggest one, and I'm not attacking, I'm not attacking this. We're all, we're all sinners saved by grace, but allowing homosexuals to be pastors should not happen. And that is being accepted by a lot of Christians all over the place. You know, there's, there's, there's churches in Idaho that are allowing them to be pastors. And listen, I'm not saying that, that they're not, you know, you know that, that the God's not working in their heart. I'm not saying that God can't do something, but I am saying to be accepting of your sin and to the point to where they can stand up and say, you know, from the authority of God and being how lifestyle sin, that shouldn't happen. These winds of doctrine, the things that get, and as you're a healthy body, you know, you start to realize these different things, this trickery. Let's look at verse 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into all things to him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part is, does its share. Every part does its share. I highlighted that. Causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So what do we do when those type of things come up? What do we do with each other? How do we grow? We speak the truth in love. First, you gotta know the truth. You've gotta know the word, not just a whole bunch of riddles and a whole bunch of poems that you got off of C.S. Lewis's books. I'm talking the word. You have to know the truth, not just about the truth. You've gotta know the truth and you've gotta speak it in love. You've got to hold them up higher than yourself and, and, and begin to talk to them in love. Why should we be doing this? That we grow all things into him. A constant state of growing, a constant state of uh, maturing. Um, you know, I want to encourage us. This should be the most encouraging message in the world because you guys are all still breathing. I'm still breathing. Everything's going good. I think. Um, but the truth of it is, we're going to leave this place right now, and I want to encourage you guys to be encouraged that we can right now pray to the Lord as we do this last song. You can pray tonight as those verses you wrote down, and if you don't know you, your position in the church, you don't know what the Lord has you doing, Lord, just pray, and he will tell you. I know he will. He's faithful. He wants, he wants you, and you know why we have to do this? Because we have to work together as one. We have to move together, and I'll tell you why. I love the picture that he uses of a body. All of us being knit together, all of us, every joint working the right way. Because listen, no matter if everything else is working, if one little bone in my ankle isn't working right, I will walk with a limp. It will hurt the whole body. Do you see what I'm saying? We all have gifts. It's not one person's job. It shouldn't be on one person's shoulders. It's all of us together. And you know what? That should be 100% um, encouraging in your heart that, that God wants to use you. That no matter who you were, no matter who you were before you came to him, forget about that. God wants to use you in this body and in the body of Christ all around the world. That should bless your heart. So I want to encourage you guys today. Let's strive to keep that unity. Everything within part of us, let's strive to keep it. Let's strive to find our spot here in this body. Let's, let's, let's encourage it to grow. Let's not be the thing that cripples it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you and we thank you. Lord, you're beautiful and wonderful, Lord, and we thank you for the message that you had for me, Lord, that you had for everyone here, Lord. Every time I teach up here, Lord, God, I get convicted in my own heart. Lord, I pray right now that you would just begin to encourage everyone's heart, Lord, that they would feel comfort, Lord, that no matter who they were before they came to you, Lord, that that, that doesn't matter. Lord, you want to use them. And so, Lord, I just pray that right now we would um, make it a point, Lord God, to, to pray and, and wait on you for, for whatever we feel like that calling is, Lord. What are we being pulled to? What are you calling us to do within this body as well as bodies around the world? How can we serve? How can we be served, Lord? Let us grow together. Let us move forward together. Lord, you are amazing. Lord, let us strive to keep that unity. Lord, let our flesh just be just not even an issue, Lord God. Let us be so filled with the Spirit daily, Lord God, that we can just move forward. Lord, I thank you, Lord. I pray that right now that every person in here as we have our um, eyes closed and heads bowed, Lord God, would just make it a point in their heart, Lord, just to once again say, Lord, fill me up. Fill me full of your Holy Spirit so I can pour it out. Lord, that people would know us, that would know that we are a body, Lord, by, by the way we love one another, by the unity we have. By, Lord, you are so amazing. Lord, I thank you for giving us this unity. Lord, I pray that we would strive to keep it. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. amen.